a few short years at the turn of the 20th century, America's most daring sportsmen jockeyed motorcycles at 90 miles an hour on steep wooden tracks. Spitting fire and burning oil, the machines had no suspension, no brakes, and only one gear. The tracks were called motodromes, wooden saucers up to a mile around and banked it up to 65 degrees. Inside these perilous American coliseums, they put their life on the line to the delight of the masses. Those who dared compete would either find fame and fortune, or they'd meet their gruesome end. Dozens were killed. Yet the legend of the Motodrome continues to inspire generation after generation. The machines were iron and steel, the tracks banked walls of rough sawn timber, and the men wore little more than wool and leather. This is their legacy, the tale of the great board track races a sport with the highest stakes that was gone just as quickly as it appeared. This is the legend of the American Motodrome. The dawn of the 20th century was a time of the great American metamorphosis. As families were still picking up the pieces shattered by the Civil War, the country began to emerge from the cocoon of Reconstruction, spreading its new steel wings of industry. The frontier was closed, having given way to rampant urbanization and a new flirtation with imperial ambition. The Gilded Age was at its height, and America charged headlong towards its destiny on the world stage. The country began to find strength in its industrial prowess and vast resources. With new technologies came new manufacturing, transportation, and recreation revolutions, molding the modern nation that we recognize today. Modernity was in fashion. Technology and convenience were reshaping life for the middle class, while consumerism and recreation were defining an emerging culture. It was in this space between cowboys and fighter pilots that a new breed of American man emerged. These men risked life and limb to compete on steeply banked wooden tracks known as motodromes, straddling loud, fire-breathing, two-wheeled contraptions. They were champions of a new type of enthusiast, the motorcyclist, and became the first professionals of a new and exhilarating sport. Moreover, the board track racer embodied a new modern ideal of American masculinity rugged celebrities of daring and charm, fearless gentlemen crisscrossing the country to the crowd's delight. To better understand how these unique American gladiators came to be, we need to first look back, before the spectacle of the American Motodrome, to the origins of the motorcycle itself. It is a story inexorably linked to the dawn of the technological age and one of its most prolific and beloved expressions, the bicycle. Historians often point to specific events in the past as harbingers of significant change, and in regard to America's coming of age, the country's 100-year celebration, the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia was bursting with everything that was to come. The late 1800s produced a flurry of technological, cultural, and economic innovation, all of which were prominently on display at the massive exposition. From international buildings to the women's pavilion and agriculture and horticultural exhibits, there was something for everyone, including the torch-wielding right arm of the Statue of Liberty. The technological marvels were the showstoppers, however, with unveilings of electric dynamos, Bell's telephone, the typewriter, even the debut of ketchup and root beer. Steam power was the energy source of the future, as evident by the 1400 horsepower coreless steam engine powering the entire affair but an odd new two-wheeled machine from England caught the eye of all to come by it. These early bicycles had evolved from crude wooden velocipedes and bone shakers to an elegant industrial design, featuring a massive front wheel, metal frame, pedals through the front hub, and a seat perched atop. The bicycle 
was a sensation. The expo ran for 159 days and drew nearly 10 million people in that time. One such visitor, a former union colonel turned entrepreneur named Albert Pope was among the many to marvel at the machines and promptly secured a license to produce the high wheel bicycles in the U.S. under his newly created mark, Columbia. Bicycles soon took New England by storm, creating new businesses, new social clubs, and a new sport racing the cumbersome bikes, commonly known as ordinaries or penny farthings. The first of these races took place at Boston's Beacon Park in 1878, and soon professionals from Europe were traveling to America to compete. Pope founded the League of American Wheelmen in 1880, advocating cycling around the country, producing city maps, and lobbying for the construction of a federal highway program through the Good Roads Movement. In 1885, British inventor John Kemp Starley refined the bicycle's design, reducing the front wheel dramatically by developing a rear wheel chain drive system. What he created was the Rover Safety Bicycle, a design that remains the basic format of bicycles ever since. The more stable and practical design made the bicycles instantly more accessible to a much broader audience, and the bicycle became a symbol for modern society. They provided recreation for the masses, utility for the industrious, and autonomy across demographics, as evident in women's fondness for bicycles throughout the emerging suffragist movement. By the 1890s, the bicycle had become a transportation and recreation revolution in America, creating an industry, a sport, and a culture that became the foundation of the American motorcycle. At the same time, the gasoline-powered internal combustion engine was being developed in Europe. Though aspects of these engines can be dated back to the late 1700s, it wasn't until the 1870s that the concept took hold in France and Germany. The culmination was Carl Benz's three-wheeled motor vehicle in 1886, largely considered the first automobile. The Parisian company de Dion Bataan already had success with steam-powered vehicles, but quickly developed a small but reliable gasoline engine for use in their popular tricar platform a few years later. That engine is often pointed to as the first capable, lightweight internal combustion engine of its type, and because the Dion licensed these engines to countless companies, they helped propel the inevitable leap from bicycle to motorcycle. The final ingredient for the motorcycle emerged out of the sport of bicycle racing itself. In the UK, the velodrome had become the venue of choice as bicycle racing gained popularity in the 1870s. These tracks were often built indoors, not only because it provided shelter from the elements, but it also provided the opportunity to charge admission. Constructed of wooden strips laid side to side in an oval with raised bank sections in the turns, these velodromes allowed for exciting high-speed contests year-round. The velodrome concept came to America with the first ordinaries, but with the introduction of the rover safety design, the sport exploded. Velodromes popped up across the country, and thousands of Americans flocked to the fashionable modern sporting events. Soon, professionals from abroad looking to cash in on the booming American market arrived in hot pursuit of opportunity. Among the first of those champions to arrive from England was John Shillington Prince, better known as Jack, who held the title of world champion in 1880. Prince came to the States in 1883 as a representative of British bicycle manufacturers, a race promoter, and a builder of velodromes. Prince was one of the first stars of the sport and became a prolific force in the industry, promoting riding clubs, building velodromes, racing, and it would be Prince who would create the sport of motorcycle board track racing in the coming years. He also began mentoring aspiring American racers across the country, one of which being a 16-year-old racer from Watertown, Massachusetts named George Mallory Hendy. With Prince's help, Hendy quickly rose to prominence, winning the National Amateur High Wheel Championship in 1886 and becoming America's first national champion. Like many other racers at the time, Hindi turned his success on the track to success in business, manufacturing and selling bicycles in Springfield, Massachusetts under the moniker of Silver King and Silver Queen. The combination of the safety bicycle design and the velodrome introduced a new form of the sport where teams would compete in multi-day, long-distance events. The star rider would spend much of the race conserving his energy behind a pacing cyclist, which led to the development of the tandem bicycle. 
tandems allowed for more riders to generate higher speeds more efficiently and for longer periods of time. Cycling had become a team sport. As cycling grew more and more popular, so too did the number of its stars, including names like Bobby Walthour, Jake DeRozier, Charles Metz, Oscar Hedstrom, and the first black world champion cyclist, Marshall Walter, Major Taylor. To capitalize on the wild popularity, Jack Prince was hired in 1894 to construct a velodrome inside New York's Madison Square Garden for the International Six-Day Championships. Prince wound up winning that year, but the venue itself would soon see the dawn of a new era, the age of the motorcycle. The tandem pacing bicycle had grown to be quite a production by the late 1890s, and recruiting enough men to make a successful team had strained the viability of the sport. Several adaptations of the tandem occurred to increase power, including adding multiple riders or incorporating emerging steam and electric power plants. It was French racing star Henri Fournier who found the combination of the De Dion Bouton gas engines with a tandem bicycle, a small team could efficiently create high speed drafts for the cyclists. In December of 1898, Fournier unveiled his motorized pacing solution to the amazement of the crowd in Madison Square Garden, and at once, all of the ingredients for the American motorcycle had come together. The moment was raw and loud. Smoke puffed from the exhaust and fumes filled the air inside the stadium as Fournier paced racer Eddie McDuffie around the boards of the garden at a speed just over 30 miles an hour. Despite the numerous and frequent breakdowns, Fournier's week in New York with the motorized pacing machines produced sensational headlines. The new mechanical marvel had commanded the attention of all who witnessed, spectators, racers, and keen businessmen alike. One such racer was a Swedish immigrant named Carl Oscar Hedstrom, who was as skilled an engineer as he was a racer. When not competing, Hedstrom operated a workshop in Middletown, Connecticut, where he built light but durable bicycles and after seeing the machines Fournier brought from France, he quickly acquired a De Dion engine of his own to begin tinkering. As more motor pacers were imported into the States, Hedstrom kept busy given his ability and reputation for improving the machines while also developing his own motorized pacer. In the spring of 1900, Hedstrom unveiled his tandem pacer configuration, a streamlined and elegant design with a vastly improved carburetor and throttle control, and a more effective chain drive. Hedstrom's Typhoon Pacer, as he named it, set a new standard in design, performance, and reliability. He and his teammate, Charles Henshaw, developed a fierce reputation on the track, even taking the Typhoon up against Fournier in Baltimore that August in one of the first Pacer-only races that were gaining popular interest. Naturally, Hedstrom's refined engineering drew the attention of everyone in the industry, but one fateful conversation with George Hendy would change the game forever. The pair discussed a partnership a few times leading up to the six-day races in Madison Square Garden, but after the event in January 1901, the pair wrote up an agreement on the back of an envelope to develop a single-rider motorized bicycle for the consumer market. With Hedstrom's brilliance in mechanical design and Hendy's manufacturing resources and business acumen, the prototype was complete by May. Hedstrom rode his graceful motorized bicycle 40 miles over rough roads from Middletown to Springfield to show Hindi. By 1901, there were several companies dealing in engine kits based on the De Dion engines, some even offering complete motorized bicycles like E.R. Thomas and the Orient Bicycle Company. But it was Hedstrom and Hindi who were able to design, produce, and quickly scale a successful motorized bicycle. Soon, an explosion of new manufacturers emerged, many springing out of existing bicycle companies, but each driving innovation, refinement, and consumer visibility. Indian was joined by dozens of American motorcycle manufacturers, brands like Yale, Merkel, Reading Standard, Thor, and Harley-Davidson. The bicycle industry had provided the business model, the social infrastructure, the manufacturing facilities, distribution and advertising channels, and many of the technological innovations. It had been nearly 30 years since the first bicycles found their way to the United States, but with them came a new and beloved aspect of American life and a robust industry supporting it. On its shoulders was being built a new era in American culture, 
and as dawn broke over a new century, the motorcycle had arrived. Just as quickly as bicycle fever swept the nation in the 1880s, so too did motorcycle mania in the early 1900s. Motorcycles followed the blueprint for the Industrial Revolution. Utility and refinement drove production and profit. Manufacturers of motorcycles, parts, and accessories sprang up by the dozens. Trade magazines kept enthusiasts up to date with the latest innovations and newest trends in the wheelman's world. Shops made space on their showroom floors for new motorcycle stock, and growing manufacturers further expanded their distribution networks. Social groups formed promoting riding, lobbying for accommodation and better roads, and organizing socials, long-distance tours, and exhibition races on local hills and horse tracks. The saying goes that the first motorcycle race occurred the day the second motorcycle was built, which isn't all that far from the truth. Daring enthusiasts and champion cyclists alike could be found gathering at local horse tracks to pit their machines against one another. It was one such track, Los Angeles' Agriculture Park on May 7, 1901, that former cyclist Ralph Hamlin bested three other entrants on his Orient motorcycle at roughly 32 miles an hour in what is widely credited as America's first motorcycle race. Found in nearly every community, these horse tracks nurtured the talents of aspiring racers and provided an enthusiastic public with the perfect venue in which to witness the birth of the American motorcycle race. Soon, a variety of events materialized centering around endurance and reliability of both man and machine. In September of 1903, the Federation of American Motorcyclists was formed to promote motorcycling and regulate competition. As the machines continued to evolve, the marketplace expanded to include a diverse field of options. New motorcycles featured belt or chain drives, clutches with gear choices, multiple cylinders and, of course, increased horsepower. The speed of the motorcycle had surpassed anything a single person could experience regularly without aid from a train, and many companies were finding that by marketing the reliability, power, and speed of their motorcycle, they could sell even more. On March 26, 1903, the first official speed trials in America were staged on the beach in front of Daytona's Orman Hotel between the dunes and the Atlantic. Indian's Oscar Hedstrom was the only motorcycle entry, setting an American speed record of 57 miles per hour on board his prototype racer that he built out of one of his Typhoon pacing machines. In the years following, Orman Beach hosted the motorsport elite as crowds poured in. In the first decade of the 20th century, the annual Carnival of Speed swelled in size, and the little town on the north end of Daytona became the center of the racing universe for decades to come, earning its title as the birthplace of speed. Indian was by far the most dominant brand by 1907, producing over 2,000 motorcycles a year. In contrast, companies like Harley-Davidson were only turning out around 150. The automobile was gaining popularity as a personal mode of transportation, but they were often preventatively expensive for the average citizen in the years before Ford's production revolution took hold. Auto racing was still a rich man's game, catering mostly to European elites and American tycoons. The motorcycle was an everyman's machine, and as such competition on two wheels far more accessible. Speed contests, endurance runs, and hill climbs had proven a lucrative selling point for brands like Indian, but some in the industry began seeking new venues in which to drum up publicity. Bicycle racing was still quite in fashion, though motorcycle exhibitions on the small bicycle velodromes often stole the show. By 1908, machines had grown too powerful for these small wooden tracks, but the crowd wanted more motorized action on the boards. Ever the opportunist, Jack Prince had his finger on the pulse and endeavored to give the people what they wanted, resulting in the emergence of a new type of venue, the American Motodrome. Just across the Hudson from Manhattan, in a suburb of Newark, New Jersey named Clifton, 
The first of Prince's velodromes to be constructed with consideration of motorcycle matches was opened on July 4, 1908. At one-sixth of a mile around, with a 48-degree banking in the corners, the stadium at Clifton was considerably wider and longer than the velodromes of the day. Still, only two motorcycles could run on the boards at one time. Three made a crowded capacity. On July 5, 1908, a crowd of 5,000 gathered to take in the Federation of American Motorcyclists National Championship meet on the new track, with young pioneer racers like Jacob DeRosier, Fred Hike, Walter George, and Charles Gustafson whizzing around the wooden oval at nearly 70 miles an hour. Hedstrom had produced a special, one-off racing machine specifically for the track, which featured a new loop frame design that cradled the engine and allowed it to sit lower to the ground. This feature would define motorcycles from that point on and help free them from their DNA and bicycle design. Henri Fournier's American pacing partner Jacob DeRosier was the day's standout and was hired by Hindi and Hedstrom exclusively to race for Indian. The deal made DeRosier the first professional motorcycle racer in America and as such, he quickly became a national star. Clifton showed manufacturers like Indian, racers like DeRosier, and businessmen like Jack Prince that interest in motorcycle racing was bubbling. There was money to be made. Prince quickly set off for Los Angeles to build the first specific motorcycle racing track in America. LA had become a new hotbed for motorcycling, both on the West Coast as well as the United States at large. Interest was in a fevered state, and the sport of racing had taken off thanks to organizations like the Los Angeles Motorcycle Club and well-built horse tracks like Agriculture Park. Riders like Paul Durkham, Morty Graves, and Charlie Balk were making a name for themselves as premier riders in the area. Prince soon found a parcel of land not far from Agriculture Park in January of 1909 and immediately began construction of his new motorcycle board track. Built exclusively for motorcycles, Prince's Coliseum was a wooden oval measuring one-third of a mile around with 45-degree banked turns. Completed in March of 1909, the Los Angeles Coliseum was an immediate success launching the motodrome era in America and the careers of several young riders. With nearly every event came new world speed records. Morty Graves and Arthur Mitchell set records on German NSU motorcycles. Jake DeRosier and young Freddie Hike rode Indians and claimed nearly every prize, while local favorites Paul Durkham and Charlie Balk mounted Reading Standard and Thor. Prince learned from the riders that negotiating the incline shift from the bank turns onto the flat straights was difficult and limiting, so he began tinkering with his design. He also painted advertisement lines along the top side of the track for motorcycle makers Race Cycle and Indian, introducing a new and lucrative element to the motodrome business model. In a brilliant business move, George Hindy saw to it that the next motodrome would be built close to Indian's headquarters in Springfield, Massachusetts. In early 1909, he secured a 10-year lease on a plot of land and contracted Prince to begin construction as soon as he completed the L.A. Coliseum. On July 31, 1909, Prince unveiled the most state-of-the-art racing facility the world had ever seen. Like the L.A. Coliseum, the Springfield Stadium was one-third of a mile in length. However, having listened to the complaints of the riders in Los Angeles, Prince made the Springfield track circular with a consistent banking. This new design made an instant impact on the speeds. When Indian star riders Freddie Hike and Jake DeRosier fired their machines up for the first time, they smashed all existing records, some by as much as 19 seconds. It had been 10 years since he stood by Fournier and his motor pacer in Madison Square Garden, but the world had changed quite a bit. Though no such title had been created in the sport of motorcycle racing since, Jake DeRosier ended the season in 1909 with papers across the country proclaiming him to be the world champion. With the Springfield Stadium Motodrome, the die had been cast. The board track era had begun in America, and Jack Prince's vision for a national professional racing circuit was underway. Not one to rest when the iron was hot, Prince returned to Los Angeles to begin construction on his most ambitious track to date. Oil tycoon Frank Garbutt and auto engineer Fred Muskovitz contracted Prince to build a massive, mile-long motodrome in the swampland at Playa del Rey in hopes of racing both motorcycles and automobiles. 
To accommodate the automobiles, Prince built the track substantially wider and with a modest banking of only 20 degrees. With over 2 million square feet of lumber and 30 tons of nails, the Los Angeles Motodrome, lovingly called the Pie Pan, opened in April 1910 to an electric crowd. The one mile long scale at Playa del Rey was an expensive affair and diminished the intimate thrill available at the smaller LA Coliseum and Springfield Stadium. So Prince set off again to construct another of his motorcycle exclusive board tracks in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake had long been a cycling town, even hosting early motor pacer races at the Salt Palace Velodrome years before. Prince built his newest track at Wandemir Park, copying his earlier circular design in Springfield at one-third of a mile long and banked at 42 degrees. For the first time, a power plant was included to run a series of electric arc lights placed around the perimeter for night races. The biggest riders in the country put on a wild show of speed for the 8,000 spectators on that hot opening night in July 1910. Prince had created a new sensation in America. The success at Salt Lake only fueled his ambitions for 1911. Beginning in Oakland, California, Jack Prince continued adding tracks to his national circuit. The Elmhurst Motodrome opened in April 1911, followed quickly by two more tracks in Denver. The Mile High City became the only place ever to house competing local board tracks, one at the White City Amusement Park and the other at Tuileries. Denver had a strong club scene and at the time was home to several local racing stars with colorful names including Johnny Albright, Glenn Slivers Boyd, Earl Red Armstrong, and Farmer Joe Walters. Up-and-coming amateurs like the Texas Cyclone Eddie Hasha and William Wells Bennett arrived in Denver, while the country's biggest stars traveled between the various tracks to challenge all who dared. Indians Jake DeRozier was now consistently being challenged by both the increasingly competitive team at Merkel as well as his own teammate, Charlie Balk. DeRozier and Balk traded titles from week to week, resulting in an intense rivalry between the Indian stars. Hindi and Hedstrom, meanwhile, had set their sights on international distribution, and in an effort to broaden their global appeal, Indians sent their very own world champion DeRozier to compete in England's prestigious Isle of Man TT road race. Sadly, DeRozier's luck ran out across the pond and he claimed no victories, while in America, a changing of the guard was underway. The number of capable professionals was steadily increasing, challenging veterans like DeRozier for dominance. New manufacturers, too, brought new competition to the heir apparent Indian, brands like Chicago's Excelsior Auto Cycle. The Windy City also became home to Prince's last motodrome of 1911, a track where the sport would undergo a seismic shift. Chicago's Riverview Park became Prince's most modern motodrome to date, and on July 8, 1911, the 74-acre complex opened to well over 10,000 in ticket sales. With DeRozier competing in England, a large field of professionals and amateurs alike rode elbow to elbow vying for top marks. As always, Indian and their main rival Merkel were at the top of the heats, but a newcomer, Excelsior, was determined to throw their hat into the ring and recruited the most promising rider to come out of the competitive scene in Denver. Farmer Joe Walters was not only a skilled motodrome rider, but an insightful mechanic as well. With Excelsior's blessing, Walters began making modifications to his racing machine, helping engineers develop a powerful new 7-horsepower V-twin. Walters and his Excelsior 7 began making quick work of claiming nearly every record on the books, consistently hitting speeds of 90 miles an hour on the boards at Riverview, putting sweat on the brows of the boys at Indian, and making 1911 the fastest summer in history. DeRozier returned to a packed field full of fast new riders, frustrated teammates, and capable new machines. Perhaps upset by his lackluster performance in England, or struggling with his Indian's lack of power compared to Walter's new seven, DeRozier was in a mood. In telegrams back to Springfield, DeRozier told Hindi to build faster bikes for him and Charlie Balk or, quote, wipe that word speed off of your advertisements. DeRozier took it upon himself to sign Balk's name to the telegram as well, and in an unprecedented move, Hindi responded by terminating both the Star Riders' contracts. At the end of the fastest summer in history, America's two biggest racing stars, Jake DeRozier and Charlie Balk, were without a ride. 
Indian quickly added fresh young talent to their squad like Eddie Hasha and Ray Seymour, while Hedstrom developed yet another groundbreaking power plant for the 1912 season. DeRozier and Balk wasted little time finding a new home with the ambitious Excelsior Company, now headed up by bicycle magnate Ignis Schwinn. The tracks in Salt Lake, Denver, and Chicago helped define the successful formula. One third to one quarter mile around, banking at around 45 degrees with grandstands and arc lights perched along the top. The expansive infields lend themselves to additional attractions like baseball and football games, as well as new daring air shows in the earliest days of flight. Companies were eager to involve themselves in motodrome racing, sponsoring riders, tracks, and buying advertising wherever they could print it. Motorcycle racing had become big business. As such, newspapers were filled with accounts from local races and national incidents, and ads touting the latest records or equipment used by the pros filled the pages. New riders were testing their grit on the boards, while hardened veterans raked in the winnings and smiled for the cameras. Motodrome fever in America was just beginning, and in time, larger, steeper tracks would allow for more riders to race in a single heat and break record after record as top speeds climbed. Motorcycle racing was entering its golden age, but the gruesome truth of speed would soon catch up. Within a decade of their American introduction, motorcycles had matured at a frenzied pace, quickly evolving from brittle, finicky gadgets to brooding, highly specialized machines. A new American industry exploded, public enthusiasm was brimming over, and the world applauded at the rise of an invigorating new sport. By 1912, the American Motodrome Stadiums offered attendees a new level of exhilaration, anticipation, and thrilling danger. This was the golden age of motorcycle racing. Motorcycles filled the city streets and county roads as fans packed into Prince's fabulous motodromes by the thousands. Young and old alike filled the grandstands to witness the electrifying jolt of the night races as men sped around at 90 miles per hour under the glow of arc lights. This was the era that racing itself was defined, a time in which men established for future icons what it took to be fast and what it meant to be a racer. 1912 marked motorcycling's crowded hour in America, but just as fast as it had taken hold, the sport began to prove the grim reality of its foundations. The technology had outpaced the precautions, and board track racing quickly became a blood sport too gruesome for urbane civil society. Jack Prince was a blur of activity in 1912, building eight new tracks in Los Angeles, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Brighton Beach, Columbus, Vallisburg, New Jersey, St. Louis, and Dallas. Do you like videos like these? Let us know by liking and subscribing. Share with your friends. And if you want to support the project more, head over to the Archive Moto Patreon page and help keep this history alive. While several pioneer racers like Paul Durkham and Cannonball Baker had left the saddle for work in the industry, veterans like Arthur Mitchell and Morney Graves were still traveling the country running with the best of them. Jacob DeRozier and Charlie Balk were getting acquainted with their new Excelsior mounts, while fresh faces Eddie Hasha, Ray Seymour, and Wells Bennett were the country's fastest rising stars. Motodrome racing had proven to be quite lucrative with racers making in one week what an average American had to work an entire year for. Prince's vision now expanded to include regional circuits with home and traveling racing teams, and wherever he could put up a track, a crowd of eager young riders waited to test their nerve on the wooden walls. For spectators, there simply was nothing like it anywhere else in the world. In an article for Scientific American, Writer Ray Fisher had this to say. A thousand speed-mad spectators clutched the edges of their seats, gasped, and peered beneath them. There was a rattle like a battery of Gatlin guns, a few streaks of flying sparks, 
a swishing sound, a thunder that shook the elevated grandstands, and when the crowd breathed in again, it was to inhale fumes of engine oil. Below them, four men on motorcycles, riding abreast along a wood wall, one above the other, flashed from the shadows into the glare of an arc and on again. Such high speeds were made capable by a new breed of purpose-built racing motorcycle. Large bores, ported cylinders, and overhead valves were just a few of the mechanical refinements turning fuel into eye-watering speed. Indian's big base 8-valve racer regained the momentum it had lost to Excelsior's debut 7 Series, while Flying Merkel managed to remain competitive despite faltering on the consumer side of their business. Thor had also been making their way up the ranks thanks to engineers like Bill Ottaway, who later would spearhead the wrecking crew, Harley-Davidson's iconic factory racing team. Excelsior continued to make improvements, both on the track as well as on the showroom floor, propelling the company to one of the top manufacturers in the country. Excelsior's hiring of Jacob DeRosier after his split with Indian in 1911 was a monumental event in the sport. DeRosier was an original competitor with over 900 races under his belt, but his career with the Chicago-based company would only seem to add to his frustrations, outbursts, and ultimately mark the end of his career. DeRosier, Charlie Balk, and many of the other top-level professionals set off for LA at the start of the 1912 season to compete on Prince's latest track, the Los Angeles Stadium Motodrome. Tensions between Balk and DeRosier were higher than ever given the pair had just been fired from Indian, so the duo battled fiercely once the track opened in February. On Sunday, March 12th, while running wide open shoulder to shoulder, Charlie Balk suddenly lost control of his machine, sending the pair into a violent crash at over 80 miles an hour. Balk was on his feet within a few minutes. DeRosier, on the other hand, was in critical condition and rushed to the hospital. He was the biggest star of any sport at the time, and his accident made the front pages of the newspapers around the country. DeRosier's recovery was slow and complicated, remaining in the hospital for months and returning frequently for surgeries to mend the tremendous damage suffered in the collision. Unfortunately, DeRosier's accident would be but the first of the tragedies to find their way onto the boards in 1912. Summer brought about the most active seasons in the sport's history, with nightly races happening across the country. In July, the Federation of American Motorcyclists held their national championships at the Columbus Motodrome for the first time on a wooden track, having taken place on dirt tracks in years before. The visibility of the sport had attracted countless amateurs in search of glory and wealth on the boards, and with little regulation, most anyone could talk their way onto a motodrome for a hair-raising ride. One such amateur, Haney Potter, a local police officer in Salt Lake City, was trying his hand on the boards of the Wandermere Motodrome when he struck another new local rider, Odin Johnson, at the end of the Memorial Day races. Johnson recovered, but Potter did not survive. One month later, at Cleveland's Luna Park, Robert Hunter lost his life, followed by Harry Davis, again at Wandermere within weeks. Racing was a dangerous sport, but that was the understood risk. The riders, the industry, and most important, the American people, showed little interest in watering down the thrill of the motodrome. On September 8, 1912, that all changed. The Valesburg Motodrome in Newark, New Jersey was built in conjunction with Electric Park and opened in July 1912. The stadium was one quarter mile around and banked at 60 degrees, one of the steepest tracks to have ever been built. It was there to a packed house of over 8,000 spectators that fate finally caught up to the blistering speeds the racers maintained. Slightly after 5 p.m., the pistol fired for the five-mile event and quickly, young Eddie Hasha took the lead on board his Indian big base. His machine misfired, allowing Ray Seymour to take the lead and as Hasha reached to adjust his carburetor, he suddenly lost control, shooting up to the top of the track at a speed of around 92 miles an hour. Hasha struck the guardrail, instantly snapping his neck and sending his body and machine flying into the crowd. His Indian then fell back down the track, colliding with Johnny Albright, who was running shortly behind the back. When the chaos calmed and the dust settled, Hasha and Albright were dead as were six spectators ranging in age from 14 to 26. 
Headlines filled the front pages of the tragedy at Valesburg. All racing was suspended, and an investigation by the mayor and the sanctioning body were launched. Oscar Hedstrom recalled his big base machines back to the factory, and several writers, including Ray Seymour, Arthur Chappell, and Shorty Matthews, hung up their helmets and took jobs in the industry. In an instant, the sport had changed forever. The one bright spark in the darkness that engulfed the sport at the end of 1912 was the daring solo record run of a young amateur named Lee Humiston. On December 30, 1912, on the wide boards of the Playa del Rey bore track in Los Angeles, Humiston mounted his new 61 cubic inch Excelsior Twin and set off for the day's speed trials. Like a lightning bolt of gray and red, he and his Excelsior shot around the massive one mile long wooden circle at Playa. The occasion was a spectacular moment in American motorcycle history and all who were present knew it as it marked the first time that a man and a motorcycle had ever reached 100 miles an hour. Humiston's achievement helped heal the still open wounds caused by the tragedy at Valesburg. The sport had changed in an instant, but with 1913 came new opportunities. Though the losses at Wandermere, Riverview, and Valesburg were still weighing on the country, 1912 had been a successful year for the sport, and Jack Prince continued expanding his board track empire. Another eight new tracks were built to support the American Motor Drone League, with new saucers popping up now in record time. New stadiums could be found in Detroit, Toronto, Atlanta, Ludlow, Kentucky, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, Chattanooga, and Houston. Tragically, before the season could even crack its first starter pistol, the darkness from 1912 fell upon the motor racing community once again. It was February 25th, 1913, following his third leg surgery since his accident in Los Angeles, that Jacob DeRozier finally succumbed to his injuries. A true champion by any measure, DeRozier's accomplishments were stacked over the years into a tower of records and victories. He stood alongside Fournier at the beginning of it all and had been racing ever since, oftentimes holding every early speed record from 1 to 100 miles. He was one of the first to hit the mile a minute mark on a motorcycle and blew well past that before anyone else could. DeRozier was the first American to compete overseas as well as the first to line up for the inaugural race at America's hollowed Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Even his machine, the infamous Indian No. 21, was the single most successful racing machine in the world before World War I. Jacob DeRozier was the first king of the motodrome and helped develop the sport into the national craze that it became. He was America's champion and a true titan in motorcycle culture. Despite their recent differences, George Hendy and Oscar Hedstrom closed the doors at Indian and led the funeral parade to lay their old fast friend to rest at home in Springfield as the nation mourned. The tragedy at Valesburg and the loss of DeRozier began shifting public opinion on motodrome racing. With the exception of the Valesburg track, who had permanently shut their gates, every track in the country resumed racing. Ticket sales were steady, Jack Prince continued erecting stadiums at a record rate, but by 1913 the good nights were becoming few and far between, as one after another, from Denver to Riverview, Atlanta to Detroit, more and more accidents on the boards were proving fatal. By July, seven riders had died either during practices or races, which when added to the 12 fatalities in the previous year, began painting a grim picture. The press were quick to turn on the sport, which had once helped sell so many papers, and the moniker of Murder Drill began making the rounds. One after another, articles began circulating, equating the sport with death itself with several illustrations depicting a demonic scene, all driven by greed for money and thrills. One such article, printed in early 1913, read as follows. It serves no useful purpose either with reference to the development of the rider or the machine. It is speed madness, pure and simple. Its purpose is to cater to the lust of risk on the part of those safely seated in the grandstand. The exploiters of motorcycle racing have everywhere shown that their sole aim is to provide thrills at the cost of others' lives, and their sole object the collection of money from such thrills. 
Curiously absent from the entire Motodrome affair was one of America's most iconic motorcycle brands. When asked about the company's absence on the Motodrome, co-founder Arthur Davidson stated famously that we do not believe in it, adding that they do not deal in freak machines, gladiator fights, chariot races, or the human sacrifices of the speed craze. According to him, Harley-Davidson's were for, quote, the safe, sane rider who uses his machine both for business and pleasure and enjoys his motorcycle as it was designed to be used. The outrage was far from unjustified, however, and in July 1913, another horrific accident landed a final blow to the sport. On the evening of July 30th, Odin Johnson, running towards the top of the track at the Lagoon Motodrome in Ludlow, Kentucky, lost control of his machine and veered towards the crowd. Johnson struck a light post, snapping it in half and killing him instantly. The wiring from the light post then ignited the fuel from Johnson's wrecked Indian, burning no fewer than 35 people, according to the local press. A total of eight souls, including Johnson, were lost that evening, two women, two men, and three children, the youngest of which being a five-year-old boy. The 24-year-old Johnson had just sent a telegraph home before the race, telling his family of his successes, his new road machine, and his wife Elizabeth's excitement over payments they were making on their first home. In all, close to 30 people, including racers, women, and children, had died inside a motodrome in 1912 and 1913. The country had finally had enough. Jack Prince built 16 new tracks in those two years, 26 in total since his first experiment at Clifton in 1908. But in 1914, only two board track motodromes will go up, one in St. Paul and the other in Omaha, Nebraska, the last of the American motodromes. For the few left standing, some suffered in disrepair for years, others burned down in massive fires, and still some struggled to find ways to put the tracks to good use. In one last ditch effort to keep the track in Atlanta opened, promoters began staging racers for the black riders in the area. Today, Atlanta's black streaks, as they were known, an intrepid group of mechanics who dared race motorcycles, remain the only known African Americans to have ever done so. For the track's promoters in Jim Crow era Southern politics, their sanctioning and lease was quickly pulled and the track fell into disrepair, though the site now is fittingly home to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. For six action-packed years, the American Motodrome captivated the nation, but in a flash they were all but gone. A multitude of factors led to the eventual decline of the venues, maintenance issues and expenses, weather interference, mounting safety concerns, decreasing factory interest, increased preference for dirt track and long distance racing, and the highly emphasized public distaste for what was oftentimes a brutal and violent sport. In 1915, Jack Prince would return to Chicago to build his newest vision in track design, a massive concept nearly ten times larger than his motodrome and three times as wide. Built of steel, concrete, and as always, timber planks. A massive oval super speedway, Prince's immense track at Maywood would mark a new era in the sport and drive the final nail into the coffin of America's sensational motodromes, the few that still remained. Prince would shift gears into auto racing and build more of his massive wooden super speedways well into the late 1920s before retiring a true racing pioneer. Many riders went on to successful careers in the industry, served valiantly as mechanics, dispatch riders, or pilots in World War I, or continued racing on dirt tracks, hill climbs, and the large bore track super speedways of the 1920s. Many of the biggest brands of the 1910s were all but gone by 1920, but Indian, Excelsior, and Harley-Davidson, who had officially entered professional racing in 1914, though never on a motodrome, all thrived well into the future and have become icons of American culture. Though the tumultuous age of the American Motodrome had its share of heartache and tragedy, the sport made fortunes for a few, provided a good living for countless more and their families, and entertained thousands. Moreover, the Motodrome helped define a new America, an industrious and daring nation, 
little rough around the edges sometimes, but never lacking in grit. Thank you.